Good afternoon. Welcome to our 223rd briefing. We have hit the total number, Pat, I hope you're paying attention, of at-bats that Joe DiMaggio had during his 56-game hitting streak 80 years ago. We haven't yet run into our Ken Keltner, so unlike Jolton Joe, our briefings will go on. And I'll give you all a minute to Google that one. With me, as always, the woman on my right who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, another familiar face, the state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Great to have you both with us. To my left, another familiar face uh, who needs no introduction, the Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. We have Chief Counsel Paramel Garg and a cast of thousands. Across the past now, what is coming on to 19 months, we have always recognized that on the other side of the pandemic, we must have a state economy that is stronger, fairer, more equitable, and more inclusive than the one that we had pre-pandemic. An inclusive recovery with broad and far-reaching impacts requires economic and workforce development strategies that address the needs of both workers and New Jersey's businesses most especially the small businesses that are not just the cornerstones of our communities, but in fact the backbone of our state's economy. On the worker side, we recognize that we need to do a little more to help job seekers who are the most vulnerable, such as the long-term unemployed and those switching to new industries and careers, regardless of whether or not their economic dislocation was due to the pandemic. We recognize that we must have resources available and at the ready for workers to reconnect to work and overcome obstacles to gainful employment. Meanwhile, employers, especially small businesses, also face challenges, as we all know, in the recovery. They face a challenge in finding the workers they need and investing in training them. We know that. Generally, job seekers have better outcomes in training programs that combine work and learning. But many small businesses, especially startups, simply do not have the resources to support new hires who need on-the-job training. So to attack these twin sets of challenges, again, on the one hand, the employee, on the other, the employer, today I'm proud to announce the new Return and Earn program. Return and Earn is a win-win solution. It will assist unemployed workers in their return to work, and it will help small businesses fill the positions they need to fill to grow, thrive, and lead our economic recovery. Return and Earn is a two-track program with parallel rails. For employers, up to $10,000 in wage subsidies to hire and train new employees with identifiable skills gaps, and for new employees, a direct $500 return to work benefit. So first, for employees, getting jobs through return and earn, they will receive a $500 return to work bonus in their first paycheck, and this bonus will be on top of any other hiring bonus or benefit provided by their employer. We know that returning to work comes with some of its own costs, for instance, the cost of transportation or childcare, and this benefit is designed to help workers meet these costs. Additionally, the Department of Labor will also coordinate its wraparound service programs with return and earn to provide additional supports for workers where they are needed. For employers, the $10,000 wage subsidy is there to help cover wages for a new employee for up to their first six months on the job, a time when employers are providing the on-the-job training to onboard and upskill new workers. Eligible businesses are those with 100 or fewer current employees, and the positions to be filled must pay at least $15 per hour. During the employer provided training period of up to the first six months of employment, return and earn will reimburse employers for half of the wages paid for regular hours worked. The total reimbursement, again, will be capped at $10,000 per new employee and at $40,000 per employer. And this reimbursement will be valid whether this training occurs in person at the job site or virtually. 
The New Jersey Department of Labor and Workforce Development, under Commissioner Rob Sarah Angelo and his team, stands ready to help connect businesses with job seekers. Those are the broad strokes, and the Department of Labor will be following up soon with all the other vital details for both interested employers and workers. We know that there are good jobs out there just waiting to be filled. Our hope is that return and earn will make it easier and faster for employers to connect with potential employees and to bring them on board. You can see the website's a little smaller print, so I'm going to repeat it. It's nj.gov slash labor slash return and earn. nj.gov slash labor slash return and earn. I haven't said this out loud in a while, but we used to say it all the time, but the words on the table before me remain, public health creates economic health. Those still ring true. We've worked hard together over the past 19 months to protect public health. Now we have a new way to work together to create our long-term economic health. Now, before I return to today's numbers, Judy, I wanted to briefly note that the research released by the Centers for Disease Control late last week, which showed rather conclusively the wisdom of our requirement for all students, staff, and visitors in our schools to wear face masks. The CDC looked at outbreak rates both uh, from both Arizona specifically and then more broadly from more than 520 counties nationwide. In the case of Arizona, they found that schools without masking policies were three and a half times more likely to have a school-based COVID outbreak than those schools which had universal masking protocols in place. And in the second study, the CDC found that after a return to school, the rates of pediatric hospitalizations were more than double in counties where masks were not required in schools versus those where masks are required. As I've noted before, none of us, I promise you, none of us take any joy in requiring universal masking in our schools, and that these requirements are not permanent. But these data prove that until we get to a point where all of our school-age students are eligible to be vaccinated, and they in fact get vaccinated, the benefits of masking as part of a layered approach to safety are inarguable. While we're on the topic, I want to reiterate one important point regarding the data we discussed last week pertaining to school-based outbreaks and the associated numbers on our dashboard. And Tina or Judy will correct me if I don't get this exactly right. These data track the number of outbreaks and cases which have been traced back to in-school and in-classroom activities. We are, are aware of additional cases among students or staff that have been traced to activities which have taken place outside of the school building and after school hours. And by the way, this is no different than it's been all along. To be sure, we take every newly identified case, regardless from where it comes, seriously. But for the purposes of our dashboard and our reporting, again, these are outbreaks in cases which local health departments, working with school officials and the Department of Health where necessary, have identified as having been due to exposure occurring within the classroom setting. Now, here are this morning's vaccination totals, and starting today, both here and on our dashboard, we are reporting out the numbers of third doses and boosters that have been administered statewide. As for boosters and reiterating the announcement Judy's office made on Friday, all individuals ages 65 and over who completed their initial two-shot Pfizer, Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine program at least six months ago are now eligible for a booster as are individuals living in a long-term care center who receive Pfizer. Additionally, those ages 18 and older who are likewise at least six months out from their last Pfizer dose and who have underlying medical conditions which may make them more susceptible to the virus or whose employment situation may also put them at higher risk are similarly now eligible for boosters. Again, at this time, only those individuals who have received the Pfizer vaccine are eligible. If you received either Moderna or J&J, &J, please sit tight for now, but the Pfizer booster is likely to cover many older persons, uh, older adults rather, persons with disabilities, healthcare workers, and others at greater risk. And I think Judy's gonna go through a couple of examples of lines of business which would qualify you if you're 18 and up uh, to be eligible.
So if you meet the eligibility standards, go to covid19.nj.gov slash vaccine to find a place near you to get a Pfizer booster. And by the way, this also includes the Gloucester mega site that has reopened to the expected demand for boosters and more sites across all counties are also ramping up capacity. I could I could predict a question we might get from our friends in the press. How many people are we talking about here? Uh, Judy, it's my understanding that as of April 1st, which is the six month ago, approximately six month ago number, all Pfizer recipients uh, are about 1.2 million. Is that about match what you've got? Uh, it will be somewhat less than that because it isn't literally everybody who got it. But that's the 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 uh, the out uh, uh, the high end of the total Pfizer universe that are six months out after their second. We also have updated today a data on breakthrough cases. Here are the overall totals for all individuals who are fully vaccinated as of September 13th. These overall totals are the best measure of the power of the vaccines as they encompass all individuals over time. This is the complete apples to apples data. And what we're seeing is clear of everyone in New Jersey who has, was fully vaccinated by September 13th. By the way, that's more than 5.4 million people. Not even one half of 1% have since tested positive. Put another way, of the 485,388 positive PCR and antigen test results returned between January 19th, that was the day when the very first people to have received a vaccine reached full vaccination, and September 13th, breakthrough infections make up only 5.4% of that total. Yes, we have seen, and we've said this before, an increase in positive tests among the fully vaccinated as the Delta variant has marched across the state, but they remain a distinct minority of cases, and there is nothing in the data that suggests a failing among vaccines. This holds true uh, through the other metrics. A total of 537 fully vaccinated individuals have been hospitalized due to COVID, but since January 19th, our hospitals have reported more than 38,000 COVID positive admissions. And the same can be true uh, and can be said for those, sadly, who we have lost. Between January 19th and September 13th, the Communicable Disease Service confirmed just shy of 5,900 deaths due to COVID-related complications. Fully vaccinated individuals have accounted for 126 of these. Unvaccinated individuals have made up 96% of our deaths over the past nine months. Here are the preliminary numbers for the week of September 7th through 12th, and the story is the same. Getting vaccinated makes you far less likely to contract the coronavirus, and even if you do, you are far less likely to de develop a case of COVID that would land you in the hospital or, please God, no, in the morgue. So to everyone who has gotten vaccinated and continues to do everything to keep yourselves, your families, and your community safe, let's take a look again at these cumulative numbers. You are all counted in here. And in the overall success of our vaccination program, and to all of you, I say, on behalf of all of us, thank you. Now let's move on to the rest of today's numbers. Here are today's newly reported positive PCR and presumed positive antigen tests. Notably, the rate of transmission over the past seven days has again dipped close to one. So that is at long last a positive sign, though I think we'll all feel better once it is below one and stays there. Here are yesterday's hospital reports. In the overall, total hospitalizations are down by more than 100 since last Monday, and uh, the numbers in our ICUs have dropped roughly 13 percent since their high last Tuesday. Those are both good signs. But we're still losing people to COVID, and here are today's newly confirmed COVID comp complicated deaths and the updated number of probable deaths. God bless them all, but as we do every day, let's honor several more of those we have lost. <clears throat> we'll begin this week with this gentleman in, in, down in Lake Como by us in Monmouth County, which was the home since 2009 of Robert Dougherty, who we lost on January 6th at the age of 78. He had called Monmouth County home since 1972. A native of Staten Island and a graduate of Jersey City St. Peter's College, his career took him from teaching chemistry at New Dorp High in New York City to practicing chemistry at the former Westwood Chemical 
Corporation in Middletown, and then to once again teaching at Red Bank Catholic, Matawan, and Freehold Regional High Schools. But what was most important to Bob was his faith, and he was a Eucharistic minister, among other duties, at St. Catherine's Parish in Spring Lake. He was also a member of the Elks and was an inveterate fan of the Fighting Irish Notre Dame football team. He would have been happy with the win over Wisconsin and anticipating the game against Cincinnati next week. He was survived by his wife, Gerilyn, his children, Julia, Jennifer, Rachel, and Dan, and their respective spouses, and 13 grandchildren, Kella, Kelly, Anna, Jack, PJ, Timmy, Sarah, RJ, Mary Rose, Henry, Lily, Aiden, Connell, and Finn. I had the great, not too Irish, Ray, uh, I had the great honor of speaking with both Gerilyn and his son, Dan, last Wednesday. He also left behind his older brothers, Paul and George, and their families, along with numerous cousins and incredible friends. We thank Bob for teaching his passion and living his faith. May God bless and watch over him and his memory. Uh, and I will use a nickname that many called him, Farewell, Bobby Doc. Twelve days later, on January 18th, and in nearby Manasquan, Lisa Mellon Hughes passed after her fight with COVID at the age of just 66 years old. Lisa had retired from a long and successful career as an accounting supervisor in the transportation department at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. And in her memory and in recognition of her long service, Rutgers University lowered their flags to half staff in her honor. But those closest to her will remember Lisa for her love of entertaining and cooking and her talent of stained glass and jewelry making. With her passing, Lisa was reunited with her biological mother, Eleanor, her adoptive parents, Genevieve and Miguel, and her sister, Maria. She left behind her husband of 23 years and her best friend, Richard, with whom I had the great honor of speaking last Wednesday. And she left behind her daughter, Jessica, and her grandchildren, Tobias, Caleb, and Evelyn. She's also survived by her brothers, Gary and Miguel, and their families, countless nieces, nephews, and cousins. And of course, she left behind a tremendous and grateful Rutgers University family. We thank Lisa for her years of service to our state's flagship public university, and may God bless and watch over her and her family. And finally for today, we honor NYPD Lieutenant Tim Coyne, who passed away at his home in Homedale on August 12th. The Delta variant exacerbated what had been years of suffering from respiratory ailments linked to Tim's heroic service at Ground Zero in, on the day of and in the days that followed 9-11. Law enforcement was not Tim's first profession. He started as a stock trader on Wall Street, but the call to serve overcame him, and he traded what was looking to be a lucrative career for the chance to protect the city of New York. On September 11, 2001, Tim was a sergeant at the first precinct in Lower Manhattan. As the towers fell, he was helping people to safety, and in the days and months to follow, he logged countless hours and extended shifts around Ground Zero, including managing the makeshift morgue to collect the victims whose bodies could be recovered. And within months, sadly, his health began to deteriorate. Over the past 20 years, Tim's health had its ups and downs, but his love of life and his desire to help and serve others never dimmed. Unfortunately, I could not be there, but on 9-11 this year, Mayor Greg Bontempo of Homedale honored Tim uh, at their annual 9-11 ceremony, so I want to thank the mayor for that. Tim is survived by family, friends, and many former colleagues. I had the great honor of speaking with his brother Jim last Wednesday. For all Tim did in the line of service, we are forever grateful. May Tim's example shine on, not just in the family he left behind, but in the officers he served alongside, and may God bless and watch over him. We remember Robert, Lisa, and Tim as we remember all who have been lost. They each led lives that were extraordinary and worth remembering, and we will remember them. Now, moving on, before I turn things over to Judy, I want to introduce you to, to these folks, Amar Gautham and Amanda Marr, the husband and wife duo behind the Princeton restaurant, The Meeting House. It's just up the block on Witherspoon Street from the Homestead Princeton home goods store, which we highlighted last week. The Meeting House is Amar and Amanda's first restaurant, and they opened less than four months before COVID hit our state. Timing not good. 
in November of 2019. Instead of welcoming customers to their dining room, they had to quickly shift to serving takeout and delivery. But they also knew there was a greater need for hot meals in homes hit hard by the pandemic, and they partnered with the Princeton nonprofit Share My Meals to fight food insecurity. To keep the meeting house open, Amar and Amanda turned to the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, and with a pandemic grant in hand, they were not only able to keep their lights on and their ovens hot, but also their staff on payroll. And today, the meeting house continues to serve takeout and delivery meals, but their dining room is once again wide open and inviting. Please check them out, 277 Witherspoon Street in Princeton, 277 Wither Witherspoon Street in Princeton. I had the great opportunity to catch up with both of them last Wednesday and thank them for their commitment to doing right, not just by their employees, but by their entire community. The spirit of the meeting house is the true spirit of our state, always looking forward and always extending a helping hand. And that spirit is what's gotten us through, all of us, through the past 19 months. A little more of it will get us through the days ahead, pandemic and post-pandemic. With that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. Well, as you know, last week the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommended a booster dose of Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine for certain groups who have received their first and second doses at least six months ago. Specifically, to reiterate what the governor shared, the CDC recommends people 65 years and older and residents in long-term care settings should receive a booster shot at least six months after their Pfizer primary series. People aged 50 to 64 years old with underlying medical conditions should receive a booster shot at least six months after their Pfizer primary series. And people aged 18 to 49 with underlying medical conditions may receive a booster shot of Pfizer at least six months after their Pfizer primary series based on their individual benefits and risks. So underlying medical conditions included in this booster authorization are similar to the ones that we followed last year. Cancer, chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, dementia or other neurological conditions, diabetes type 1 and type 2, Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathies or hypertension, HIV infection, immunocompromised situations, liver disease, overweight and obesity, pregnancy, sickle cell disease, or thalassemia, smoking, current or former, solid organ or blood stem cell transplant, stroke or cerebrovascular disease, and substance use disorders. This list does not include all of the potential medical conditions that could make an individual more likely to get severely ill from COVID-19. Other medical conditions may put people in more danger from uh, COVID-19. So individuals who want to get a booster but are not sure if the definitions outlined by the CDC apply to them should talk to their health care provider to determine if the benefits of receiving the booster outweigh the risks. The CDC director, Dr. Rochelle Walensky, also added a fourth category to those who can receive a booster. People aged 18 to 64 who are at increased risk for COVID-19 exposure and transmission because of occupational or institutional settings may receive a booster shot at least six months after their Pfizer series based on their individual benefits and risks. As Dr. Walensky explained over the weekend, those who are at increased risk because of occupational or institutional settings are those who live and work in high-risk settings. That includes people in homeless shelters, in group homes, in prisons, people who work with vulnerable populations. It also includes healthcare workers, teachers, grocery store workers, and public transportation employees. So I want to encourage anyone who is eligible under any of these categories to line up and get a booster. As of this morning, 106,542 106,542 booster and third doses have been administered, including 14,592 doses administered over the weekend. 
third doses were authorized last month for immunocompromised individuals because the two-dose vaccine may not provide the same level of immunity as it does to non-immunocompromised individuals. On Friday evening, the Department of Health directed our vaccination partners to begin administering booster doses immediately. Individuals are not required by vaccination providers to provide proof of a medical condition or a note from a medical provider to receive a booster dose. So the department continues to emphasize the need for those who are not yet vaccinated to do so as soon as possible. It is especially important for those between the ages of 12 to 17 to get vaccinated to prevent COVID-19 transmission. Currently 59.7% of those between the ages of 12 and 17 have received at least one dose but we need to see that number increase. Currently, there are 23 in-school transmission outbreaks with a total of 102 cases. Today, there are 11 children hospitalized with COVID in our hospitals in New Jersey, including three in the intensive care unit. While we have had no new reports of multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children, we have had cumulatively 133 cases. All of those children have had COVID and the majority of them were in the hospital at some point in time. And sadly in New Jersey, there have been seven pediatric deaths due to COVID. So I want to encourage parents to schedule appointments for their children to be vaccinated. There are more than 1600 vaccination sites active in New Jersey right now, including more than a thousand which offer the Pfizer vaccine. Many have walk-in availability and evening hours. To find a vaccination site and book an appointment online, visit covid19.nj.gov finder or call the state's vaccine call center at 1-855-568-0545. For those who received Moderna or Johnson & Johnson vaccines, the CDC announced that it is evaluating the available data with urgency to make the additional recommendations for those individuals as soon as possible. For my daily report, as the governor shared, 1,047 hospitalizations of COVID-19, positive patients and persons under investigation. Uh, there are no new reports of multi-system inflammatory syndrome at our state veterans' homes. There are two new positive cases among residents in the Vineland home and at the state psychiatric hospitals, two new cases among patients at Ancora. The daily percent positivity in the state as of September 23rd, 4.60. Uh, the northern part of the state reports 4.08%. The central part of the state, 5.22%. And the southern part of the state, 4.93%. So that concludes my report. Please continue to stay safe, get vaccinated, to protect ourselves, our family, our friends, and our children. Thank you. Judy, thank you. Uh, very helpful color on the booster uh, in particular, and thank you for everything. Um, Pat, I thought we had a really productive uh, virtual town hall with, with folks trying to get back on their feet after the Ida the storms, with FEMA, with Senator Bob Menendez, with yourself, other members of the administration. Uh, and, and several hundred uh, residents with a lot of good questions, so much so that I think we're going to probably do this again. Is that right? Yes, Great sir. Have you. Thanks, Governor. Yeah, to the, your point, the governor hosted the virtual town hall on uh, Friday morning um, and just having our partners with FEMA, particularly the federal coordinating officer, Patrick Cornbill, on there to answer uh, any and all questions that came up and to also push information out. It was extremely productive. I got a, a ton of positive feedback on that, and I think we're tentatively scheduled to do one uh, next Monday as well in further details on that. Um, weather, pretty decent week, but uh, there will be some rain and potential thunderstorms tomorrow, but not being uh, deemed severe at this point by National Weather Service. But as, uh, as always, always keeping an eye on not only uh, here in New Jersey, but the things that form out off the coast of uh, Northern Africa and in the Atlantic. So always keeping an eye on that, Gov. Thank you. Pat, thank you. Um, one thing, if somebody was not on the um, call on Friday, uh, and, and you may be watching today and you're in one of those 12 countries, counties with the major disaster declaration. Um, 
pretty resounding advice. Go to disasterassistance.gov as your first stop, even if you ultimately go to the Small Business Administration, which is sba.gov. Go to disasterassistance.gov as your first port, port of call. Um, and then secondly, you may end up getting to sba.gov, depending on whether it's a mortgage or you've got, a, in fact, you've got a small business, and you may well then get routed back to disasterassistance.gov. So there's a real potential for a round trip. And the other thing that I heard, Pat, is if you get rejected, get right back in there and figure out how you may be able to cure your application. It may have been just one data point that you may have left off or filled in the wrong field by accident. Don't, don't take that first rejection as, as an ultimate um, resolution. And please buy flood insurance, whether you're in a flood plain or flood zone or not going forward. That's just got to be good advice. Um, with that, we'll, we'll take questions. We'll start with Matt. We'll be back. I will stay with this cadence, I think, for the next couple of weeks at least and see where the, the variant takes us. So we'll be back together uh, Wednesday at 1 o'clock, unless you hear otherwise. With that, Matt, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. And you answered Sophia's one of my got, questions about... Sophia's got the mic for the first time, so I wanted to make sure I made that point. Sorry. No problem. Uh, so you answered one of my questions about the uh, mega site, but what's the current feeling about the demand that there will be for boosters? Are you able to uh, track the number of people looking to book appointments compared to uh, eligibility? Uh, on return to earn, where is the money coming from, and is there a limit on how much the state will dole out? Does it take effect immediately? Uh, and from Carly from Politico, hundreds of kids are still without transportation to school. How many districts have reached out to your administration about bus driver shortages, and what plans do, does your office have to address the problem? Um, we believe we'll be able, like Judy, you should weigh in here. We believe we'll be able to manage the, the, the demand, but we have said for, for quite some time that we expect a, a supply demand imbalance at least early on. I mentioned 1.2 million is the sum total, plus or minus, of folks who got both Pfizer vaccinations by April 1st, which would put them on, uh, on pace later this week to be at the six-month uh, mark. Um, anything you want to add to that, Judy? Um, we, we have all the num numbers uh, broken down by county, and we are encouraging every county, and we expect every county, um, with support from the Department of Health to uh, open up a static vaccination site to be able to accommodate their county residents. In addition to the Gloucester Mega site, which will open uh, this week, appointments will be able to be um, scheduled at the end of this week. And we will, we're also encouraging walk-ins to your federally qualified health centers, your acute care hospitals, um, your local Department of Health, uh, and um, any existing sites. So we will be tracking it, as usual, on a daily basis. Thank you for that. Return to Earn is coming from American Rescue Plan money. Uh, and I would characterize it, we're pretty excited about it, but I would characterize it as a pilot. Uh, we're going to put $10 million into it and get it off the ground. And, and see what the, the uptake is. And if it is as significant as we anticipate it may be, we'll find ways to amp that up. Um, I don't have the district number, but Alex Altman is with us. We can get back to you. We, we know that at the peak, there were 7,000 students impacted, or Dan Bryan, can, one of the two, 7,000 students impacted by shortage of bus drivers. Uh, we have worked literally matchmaking between Department of Labor, where folks are looking for jobs, where we know we know that they're out there, uh, and with with districts, um, and th there's a you know there's there's like a lot of things in life, there are some answers that folks think are really easy, magic wand. Why don't you just do X or Y? And this is uh, this is a profession, an occupation that is more far more complicated due to this very specific licensing requirements. So we're working. Uh, and we'll continue to work with districts. There's no question it's an issue, but we are uh, directly involved, matchmaking, trying to trying to get this as solved as fast as, as possible. Thank you. Joey, is that you? Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon. Uh, so two things. One, I believe you mentioned last week um, about a learner's permit, per, learner's permit pilot program in Wanaku on Saturday. I just want to know how did that go, and more generally, um, what is the hesitation to fully open, reopen the MVC for all transactions, as some people have called for it to do? Um, and then second, uh, you have expressed support in the past both for lifting um, the SALT cap and also for the uh, Democratic plans currently being discussed in Congress. Would you support a Democratic plan if it comes out this week that does not include um, removing the SALT cap? And what have you generally talked about with the state's congressional delegation as it relates to these matters? I'll get back to you on the, the learner, learner's permit on, in Wanakew if you all could help me with that. Um, so we'll get, bear with us on that. Um, Listen, like everything else in life, we want to do things as safely as possible. So that's safety is is a, a big sort of environmental issue as it relates to getting everybody back to work. I think we started in early July encouraging folks to come in, depending on what department of government you're in, for a couple of days a week. We're full on, I think, in uh, by October 18th. Uh, and we've had success after getting hit by a tsunami in both motor vehicles and unemployment insurance benefits. We've had success with motor vehicles on doing a lot of this stuff by remote. Um, and that's probably, again, I don't think you can say, say silver lining to something that's been as tragic as this, but that's, that's probably a muscle memory that we picked up faster than we otherwise would have that we'll use going forward. Um, Listen, I'm, I, I, on behalf of New Jersey, I'm, I'm a pig. I want it both ways. I want the infrastructure money, and I want the salt cap lifted. Uh, and I will keep fighting until uh, we get both. Uh, it's the single biggest tax increase on the middle class in the history of our state. Uh, and it was political. It was the Trump administration. It was directed at states like ours. And we're not going to quit until we get it lifted. Uh, and, and at the same time, as, as the most densely populated state in the nation, uh, clearly as a state that's going to be impacted by climate change as much as any state, given our extraordinary location, we need the infrastructure dollars and we need them as soon as possible. In many cases, to scale up and accelerate stuff that we're already doing. In some cases, there, there'd be new programs and new impulses, but in most cases, it's taking what we're doing and make it bigger, stronger, and faster. Thank you. Alex, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, for the commissioner, for Dr. Tan, are you aware of a report that there's a seventh grader in Haddon Township who unfortunately passed away, who was previously diagnosed with COVID? I was wondering if this is a COVID death or could this have been multi-inflammatory syndrome in children? For the colonel, you mentioned that Zoom call on Friday about Ida relief. During that call, you mentioned reports of looting in Manville. Can you talk a little bit more about that and explain what happened? Also today, the FBI crime statistics came out that show a 30% increase in homicides nationwide. Did New Jersey experience a similar surge, and why do you think this rise in crime happened last year in 2020? Governor, for you on return and earn, why do you think that you need to coax people to come back to the workplace with these $500 incentives? And is this a slap in the face to those who earlier in the pandemic took jobs, perhaps even lower paying jobs, despite the fact that they were you know, laid off and finally, who's going to supervise the doling out of these payments? Is it going to be the Labor Department? And how can you be confident that they'll be able to do this well after the debacle that unemployment became in the first few months and continues to be for some? <laughs> I love the way you ask these questions. Um, I think for privacy, we, we, we never respond to privacy questions, uh, 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 questions about a particular uh, patient or, sadly, a loss of life. But I would just repeat, Judy, what you said. Sadly, we know with a heavy heart there are pediatric cases in the hospital, and we have lost the lives of children. Thank God, not many, but we've lost lives. And one is any, any loss is too many, uh, period, but certainly particularly mournful when they're kids. Um, Pat, I'll kick it to you. Um, uh, let, me, let me address the, the, the last two first. Um, yeah, it's, it, your, your question uh, on... Why do, why do you think we need to coax people is, is a fascinating one right now. And you see this not just in New Jersey, you see it around the country. Lots of job openings. I mean, I haven't been in a restaurant, a bar, a small business where literally not one, where folks said they couldn't hire the folks they wanted to hire. And at the same time, you've got a lot of folks over here um, who are maybe looking for work, 
may have made a life decision. There's a whole combination of reasons why you've got this mismatch. We think cash on the barrel alone uh, is interesting, but it's even more interesting when you put a workforce development and upskill uh, component to it. I think I've said this before. You get a lot of people right now who are washing dishes, uh, just using that as an example, for $12 an hour who are saying, wait a minute, I could go down the street and, and get 18 bucks an hour to do X or Y. This is hopefully some way to accelerate, accelerate that process um, and get, those, get the match, matches made between the openings and the folks who are either unemployed or want to upskill themselves to a, a, a different and better job. Uh, the Department of Labor will be overseeing this program, and I will just say that all things considered, that they were hit with a tsunami, and, and, uh, and this is not to make anybody who's out there frustrated still awaiting um, adjudication on a claim. I don't blame you for being frustrated, but I, I would put our state's record up against any in the country. Pat, the law enforcement, I, I don't think we're immune to an increase uh, in, uh, in violent crime. That was a, that's an American reality. You, you can get into the details of it, and I think the pandemic is probably a big factor in terms of the stress, the mental stresses that have put on so many folks. And as I recall, the mayor of Manville reached out to me, uh, and I went to you immediately, and you guys were on the scene that afternoon, so take it away. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, with regard to that, I know uh, we have a tendency to use the term looting. Uh, I think in this case, though, Alex, it was more of a rummaging complaint. So all those homeowners that had bought uh, their damaged belongings out to their curb, uh, and there were outsiders coming in all hours of the night, parking, blocking traffic, and in, on the heels of experiencing one of the greatest you know, tragedies of their lives, that became not only a nuisance. So uh, not really sure that that was criminal behavior, but it was certainly behavior that we wanted to put an end to, and that's why uh, I talked to the chief there, and that's why we sent the state troopers in for a few nights there, and that almost immediately dissipated. So just a clarification on uh, the term looting there. Uh, and as the governor said, yeah, we have not not been immune to the uh, increase in homicides. I could probably have the exact uh, figure for you in our increase. I'm not so sure it's as high as 30, but I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to underrepresent our reality. Um, I do think the pandemic, the stressors caused by that, and I think at the, the heart of it lies illegal crime guns in the hands of, uh, of violent recidivist offenders. And that weapon used in Newark, we've seen it used in Trenton, we've then seen it used in Atlantic City, and our ability to to focus in on not only those violent offenders, but also in getting those crime guns off the streets is where we're working with all of our federal, state, uh, county, and local partners. And, and I would just add to this last point, we are proud to have in the top couple of strongest gun safety laws in America. We continue to have no issue and stand by the Second Amendment, but of those crime guns, Tell me, at least 80% of them are coming in from outside of New Jersey. That's the, the, the issue here, which is maddening. Uh, we just had, I could see, I won't get into specifics, but just yesterday, up on Interstate 78, we had a stop where nine illegal handguns were recovered. That's one motor vehicle in one traffic stop in probably one of the, the greatest traveled states in the United States of America. So our efforts with the ATF and, again, all of our other partners continue. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, I, I'm told, uh, Joey, you asked about the pilot. I'm told it went well and that we're looking for more remote uh, opportunities. And uh, I should have said in, in my earlier answer, notwithstanding all of the frustration and, and challenges to get reopened and back on our feet, the MVC is, is as we sit here today, is clipping along at somewhere around 20 or 25 percent more transactions process per week than pre-COVID. So for all of the frustration, again, like an unemployment benefit, if you're, if you, if you're out there waiting for your appointment or your, the, the process to take and you're frustrated, I don't blame you. Uh, I, I am on your behalf as well. Uh, but there's no question we, we, we've, made, we've made progress and specific to your question about the, the WANAQ experience. We're going uh, to look for more opportunities to, to do remote activities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, what is your reaction to Penn East saying it's stopping all development of its pipeline project? And second question, is New Jersey considering a test and stay program for schools? 
Other states like Massachusetts and Georgia are using the model which allows students who are exposed to someone with COVID to remain in school as long as they have no symptoms, wear a mask, and test negative for seven days. Thank you. Very gratified uh, by the decision to pull out permanently on the pennies front. You know, we, we analyze and assess these projects one at a time. We, we want to make sure we fairly call balls and strikes to make sure all sides are heard uh, and that we make decisions. You know, we've got an overall 300-something page plan to get us to a 100% clean energy economy by the middle of the century. There's no question where we're going to end up. But there are legitimate questions on how you get there, Project X versus Project Y. This is one that has stuck out since before I was governor as incredibly egregious. Uh, the need was always uh, questionable, but more importantly, it would have ripped up preserved lands, private lands, some incredibly valuable ecosystems, and done irreparable harm. Um, and this one was just way out of bounds. And it's the one, it's the singular one that I've said for a long time. Again, this probably goes back at this point five years. It's just, it, this is one we just cannot have and in, in, in even, even uh, think about in this state and that we would do whatever it took to prevent that from happening. And you, I don't think you've heard me say that about other projects, but that's just a blanket. This one was bad. It would have wrecked our state. And uh, as long as I'm here, that's not, that's not gonna happen. Um, I think we are, Judy, tell me if you have, uh, have insight on this or Tina, we gotta make sure we get Tina, give her, get her money's worth here. Uh, we're comfortable with the current protocols we have in school, period. We're gonna go with that. And if we, we always leave lots of different options on the table, but now we're three weeks in and we think what we've got, it isn't, fail, it isn't foolproof in the sense that we've got outbreaks, but we, we knew that would be the case. But I think we're comfortable with where we are. Is that fair to say? Okay. Last but not least, Dave, you can take us home here. Thanks, Governor. Um, I'm sure you're aware New York will not extend unemployment benefits to health care workers who refuse to get vaccinated unless they present a doctor-approved request for a medical accommodation. What is your opinion of this, and would you consider the same kind of situation for us here in New Jersey? Even though the... Um, New CDC data shows that students wearing masks have fewer outbreaks in schools. Some parents have expressed concern about masks limiting oxygen for youngsters and masks collecting potentially dangerous bacteria on the surface of the mask. I think, Dr. Tan, this is maybe where you're going to get your money's worth. Uh, <laughs> you help me out here, Dave. Please remind us what studies about this we have, what has been found, and what do you say to parents who have these concerns that they believe are legitimate? And finally, now that the booster shot campaign has been launched, um, I know you guys said that you're gonna track this and so forth and, and uh, initially demand may outstrip supply, but what are you hearing from around the state? Are there long lines, big waits, delays in getting an appointment? Um, and how different is the situation we're in now with in terms of supplies and locations for giving shots compared to the first couple of months of the vaccine rollout? Thank you. All good questions. I'll take a shot and then we definitely get, we need Tina to come in here from uh, the bullpen. Um, no, I, I, I don't know that I'm not read in completely to the, to the New York situation. Um, uh, and by the way, I should say I had a very good uh, sit down with Eric Adams, uh, who was candidate for mayor of New York City uh, uh, in the election. Um, but I don't think we've got any plans to do that here. We, we've got, you know, you're, you're required to be vaccinated, but we continue to have that option. We, we, not an option. I don't want to make it an option. We want you to get vaccinated, period. But for whatever reason, we'll leave the, the, uh, the, the anxiety out of it for a minute. If you're not vaccinated, you need to be subjected to up to multiple tests per week. We think that package um, is the right package, unless Judy or Tina think otherwise. Um, listen, I met one of these parents, a uh, uh, husband and wife, I think, uh, lit me up in uh, Millville yesterday down in Cumberland County, where I spent a couple, several hours, uh, very special community and special county. This is stuff that, uh, I mean, I, again, I'm putting aside the kid who's got a very particular medical issue, 
where we need a doctor's or a healthcare professional's note to attest to that. I'm leaving aside, we're not going to have any more of these days, even with, even with global warming and climate change, a 100 degree day with 100 degree, 100 percent humidity. So there are, so put, let's put those carve outs. This is stuff that they're, they're, they're reading this stuff in places and they're believing it, sadly, from talking heads and others who claim that they've got some amount of medical expertise and it's, it's putting their kids and putting others into harm's way with their health. Um, but I'll let Tina come in with a more, with a more um, scientific answer on, again, limited oxygen or bacteria that may build up on, on, on the mask. Um, anecdotally, on the booster, um, first of all, the, the, the feds had a little bit of a back and forth, as you noticed over the past number of weeks. Um, and I think that created some amount of, at that level, some amount of confusion. Um, so that's what we're trying to be as explicit as we are today to dig out of that confusion and make it as crystal clear as possible in New Jersey. We also, from moment one, and I give Judy and, and her team, including Tina, a lot of credit for this, we de-bureaucratized this process. So we never asked you to prove that you had X or you worked in Y or give us your, your uh, driver's license or any of that. Our view was the more shots in arms, uh, assuming you're eligible and you're doing the right thing, the faster we get that done the better and safer we'll be as a state. That's our same mindset for the boosters as well. Anecdotally, and again, I'll defer to you all, um, I haven't heard, at least as we sit here, the, the stories that we heard on December 15th through sort of Easter, where you had a huge amount of supply demand imbalances. And my guess tells me we'll have some of that, but not remotely at the same level. Is that fair to say? Tina. How about I can't breathe uh, or, and or bacteria on my mask? Somebody in Congress said that that's how they got COVID. They thought they got it. This is a couple of months ago because of bacteria on their mask. Please, nice to have you with us. Thank you, Governor. Um, first, just to take a step back, um, when CDC issues guidance, um, what they usually do is that they review a whole breadth of literature and studies and analyses and come out with these scientific briefs that support everything that they put in their guidances and their recommendations. So several months ago, CDC had issued a science brief looking specifically at any sort of adverse events that might be associated with um, masking uh, in light of these particular questions and concerns that, um, that have been raised. And uh, you know, to cut to the chase, uh, the, the short answer is that there are no adverse events that are associated with masking. So for example, the issue of, uh, of lower oxygen, CDC, for example, looked at a very specific study um, that, that showed that there was no impact on oxygenation, for example. Um, that said, um, you know, to those individuals who are still concerned about masking, we have um, the CDC, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics. That's the association that represents um, uh, professionals, uh, medical professionals that take care of children. Um, you know, all highly and strongly recommend masking as um, a very important piece in layered prevention to prevent the spread of um, uh, COVID-19 among um, not only the pediatric population, but among the community in general. Anything you want to add to that, Judy? Uh, and again, on the, uh, we're going to monitor, as you can imagine, the, Judy said something on the distribution, which I want to come back to, to to, to make the point, we have over 1,600 points of distribution, but not all of them are Pfizer. Uh, and I think you said over 1,000 of them are, have, have Pfizer. Uh, so there's a lot of places you can go, and that's a, a point. Plus, we open Gloucester, as you mentioned, back up. Uh, and, and Judy also mentioned something I want to underscore. We're working with all 21 counties so that there's at least one significant um, hub location in all the 21 counties to go to. Pat, you got, I, I don't know if Alex, Alex's question was about 2020 or 2021 on uh, homicides. Yeah, so this is on, Pat's got some numbers on 2021, but. Uh, yeah, in 2021, year, <laughs> or, or year to date, our shooting murder victims are up 15% since 2020. Uh, I think our hit victims are up 20%, but I could, we could really offer you offline a very deep dive on comparisons, not only with last year, but on, you know, in the last five or 10 years, Alex. Again, up, but not up at the level of the national uh, 
seeing similar reasons and trends, but not at the level. It's still half the national average, but it's still a, it's a concern. Still higher. Part of our mission every day on the public safety front. We'd like that to be going down 15% uh, a year. Um, so that's it for today. I want to thank Judy and Tina, Pat, uh, Paramel, Sophia with the mic, Alex, Dan, the rest of the team here. Again, we'll be back, <clears throat> unless you hear otherwise, Wednesday at 1. Um, if you're eligible for that booster shot, and again, Pfizer only, uh, that you're six months after you've had your second dose, which would be late March going into early April this week, that would be the equivalent, and you're in the age group where you've got a, a medical condition that makes you eligible or you've got an occupation that makes you eligible, get out there and get it. Uh, we'll monitor that like a hawk in terms of making sure we've got uh, the supplies as close to you and as ready for you as possible. If you haven't yet been vaccinated, period, please go and get vaccinated. Get that first shot and get that process going. We know it is the number one thing we can do to prevent this. And to the millions of you who have done the right thing from the bottom of our hearts, we say thank you. God bless.